This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Historians accept that the Griffin, Robert Cavalier de la Salle's ship, was the first commercial vessel built by Europeans to sail on the Great Lakes. In the waning summer of 1679, on the return leg of its first trip, the Griffin disappeared. This was a harbinger of things to come over the next few centuries for vessels plying the Great Lakes. Many European and then American ships would follow in its wake, and some would disappear. The disappearance of the Griffin remains symbolic, although lost in the deep echoes of time. In the centuries between the loss of the Griffin and the 1975 sinking of the celebrated Edmund Fitzgerald, memorialized in song by legendary folk singer Gordon Lightfoot, the records show that an alarming number of shipwrecks occurred on the Great Lakes. Exact numbers are not known. If one considers vessels that wrecked but were later returned to service, the number certainly swells into the thousands. Most did not mysteriously vanish like the Griffin. In addition to the perils of storm-tossed seas, a number of circumstances claimed many hundreds of lake boats. Collisions, groundings, strands, fires, boiler explosions, and capsizing all contributed to the demise of ships, often with breathtaking loss of life. But above all, the sinister wrath of the storms that brew over the Great Lakes has challenged and defeated some of the staunchest vessels ever constructed in the shipyards of port cities along the U.S. and Canadian lakeshores. Shipbuilding here evolved along with shipping worldwide. Sail gave way to steam. Wood gave way to iron and then to steel construction. Notwithstanding even the latest technologies in ship construction, many lake boats were susceptible to calamity in the face of the heavy weather so common on the Great Lakes. All styles of ships, all materials of construction, all kinetics of propulsion— have found the lake bottoms over the centuries since the Griffin. Perhaps it is hard to understand why so many ships went down, in light of the very nature of where they occurred, in lakes. The notion of shipwrecks may conjure the wild vastness of oceans where hurricanes form and whales frolic, not the placid fresh water of lakes. But once you have eyed the enormous expanse of fresh water that comprises the Great Lakes, the largest body of fresh water in the world, the prevalence of wrecks ceases to surprise. When you have seen the lakes and heard the winds howl, you can come to understand. On June 26, 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway officially opened. U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II presided over the ceremonies. Through dredged waterways and a series of locks and canals, linking the Great Lakes to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Atlantic Ocean, ocean-going ships from across the globe were accorded access to the robust economies of the United States and Canada as never before. This trade remains vibrant today, but the ease of navigating the St. Lawrence River after that day in 1959 mustn't be considered the start of sailing the river for commercial gain, for the practice was born nearly a century before. In two of the opening chapters of this book, I write about two early lake boats that traveled and traded extensively in the ocean trades, utilizing the St. Lawrence River in a wilder era. The purpose of this book is to detail the fascinating stories of a few of the many ships that sailed the Great Lakes, mostly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Some of the accounts in this book have been related elsewhere and by others. In those cases, I have sought to add to the record, to provide more details or background story, and to expand upon the legacies of these ships and peoples and disasters. I researched and wrote these pieces over many years without the idea that they would ever come together in a book. As a result, readers may begin anywhere in the book, guided by their own interests. This book is not merely a study of shipwrecks, compelling though the subject is, in a couple of instances, I cover only the launchings and entrance into service of two iconic lake boats, the Eastland and the Augustus B. Wolven, that would later meet contrasting fates.